Good morning. Welcome to the Church of the Nazarene. We're here to worship God, and uh, the announcements are in your bulletin, so please refer to that. The scripture says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. So please stand, and let's sing joyfully.
have in these hands and multiply God, all that I am and find my heart On the altar again, set me on fire Set me on fire Take all I have in these hands and multiply God, all that I am and find my heart On the altar again, set me on fire Set me on fire
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You. you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is As we come to a time of prayer today, I think we all are praising the Lord for moisture. I know I am. I had a little praise service at my house yesterday for all the rain and just cooler temperatures. Um, for some of you, you, you know what it's like, but uh, for me, I'm not used to going that long without some rain. So uh, it, it's the first rain I've really seen since I've been here that's been of that magnitude. I've seen a few drops, but I'm not sure those count. <laughs> but um, we do want to give thanks to God for raindrops, showers of blessing, 
the way he falls upon us with the power of his Holy Spirit renews us and reminds us that when we feel dry on the inside, he's able to come and give us a sweet overflow of his love and mercy. And I hope you're sensing that today as we've been worshiping. I want to thank the, the worship team. I have said before, but I'm so grateful to Sharon and to, to Lloyd and their worship teams. Um, they're both anointed. They're anointed by the Lord. And I am uh, so grateful for their gifts and talents to share with us. As we go ahead and look at some things, I, I would really want to encourage you to take a bulletin home with you, not just to read uh, the news, things that are in there and the highlights of activities, but also there's that section to pray for people. And we have a lot of prayer needs, uh, and especially this week. And so if you would please just take that bulletin home and, and read through that and pray over it, I know that uh, those prayers would be so appreciated. And uh, I know that today is, to, is Donovan's birthday. I'm not sure where he's at. But uh, if you see Donovan, wish him a happy birthday. Uh, he's 20 years old. And we just pray birthday blessings over Donovan. And I think of those that are experiencing the fires. Uh, we think of Hawaii and um, Canada. Uh, such tragedy, um, so many lives that have been lost and family members that are not sure, they haven't heard whether their loved ones are alive or not. So let's please continue to pray for those precious people. And then Dwayne shared with me that he and Carolyn have a friend uh, in Alaska named Peyton. And Peyton's brother passed away very unexpectedly and then he just found out that his daughter was in a head-on uh, collision. And so he's uh, been hit very, very hard. And uh, I know that Dwayne and Carolyn have really tried to minister to him. Uh, Dwayne shared that he is not a Christian. And so let's pray for Peyton um, that God will do a mighty work and come close to him and help him during this time. And I know that you all have needs as well. So let's go to the Lord who knows every concern and everything upon our heart, whether it's spoken or unspoken. Lord Jesus, as we come into your presence in this time of prayer, we thank you that you're a God that is constantly working. Lord, when we are so weary and tired and even sleeping, the scripture tells us that you don't slumber and you don't sleep but you're actively working, always doing something behind the scenes that we as humans can't often see. We thank you for the times that you do let us see the, th the work that you're doing. But I pray, Father God, that as we come to you today and we're still praying for people and situations that we're not seeing results to just yet, that we will trust you, that we will know that you are indeed hearing our prayers and that you're faithful. Lord, I thank you for this congregation and I thank you for these people that love you and that are in relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them today from on high, that you would bend down to where we are and minister to us, meeting unspoken needs and requests. Lord, that you'd undertake for those that are heavy on our hearts from our list in the bulletin. We think of Dwayne and Carolyn's friend, Peyton. Lord, I can't imagine going through some of these kinds of tragedies and, and not knowing you. So we pray in the name of Jesus today that you would use someone, or maybe more than one, to reach out to Peyton to help him to come to know you to know that you're that place of refuge, that place of salvation, a place, Lord, where he would be able to give all of his cares and concerns and he could know the God that we know here today. Lord, as we prepare to look at this message today, a little bit further into the book of Jonah, I pray, Lord, that we will 
set aside our preconceived ideas and Lord, we would let you minister to us afresh and anew. I know you sure have done that to me as I've prepared this. And Lord, we want to pray the prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today's message begins by returning to that last verse of Jonah in chapter 1. The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. The fish often gets the attention here. However, for those of you who were maybe English majors, you know that the subject of the sentence is not a great fish. It is the Lord. The point is that the Lord provided a way of delivering Jonah. As I mentioned last week, some scholars raise their eyebrows about this book. They say that Jonah could not have possibly lived inside that fish for that long. I cannot understand why people get so hung up on this because we know that we serve a miracle working God. I mean, he caused the blind to see, the lame to walk, and above all, Jesus Christ himself died, was buried, and rose to life again. What else do people have to see to know and grasp that there is nothing, absolutely nothing impossible ever for our God? The simple truth is, is that Jonah's survival after he was thrown overboard into such a violent storm is nothing short of miraculous. However, as a side note, we are not to get so caught up in seeing miracles that we miss the who, the person that's behind the miracles. Seeing miracles is glorious to be sure, but it's far more important to know the mighty God performing them. You remember that the Pharisees in Jesus' day kept wanting miracles, miracles, more miracles, Jesus did countless miracles before them, and they still would not believe. I always say that it's interesting to me that they're called the Pharisees because they were so blind to what was happening right in front of their eyes. Jesus knew their hearts. He was on earth to fulfill his father's mission and he really didn't have time for this kind of nonsense. We are to expect miracles today, but we do not demand them. We rejoice and we give God praise when he does perform them, but we resist the temptation to grow angry at him when he chooses to work in a different way than our humanness can understand. God used a miracle to intervene and save Jonah from death. Some may not consider being inside a large fish uh, as an, a miracle of grace, but it actually was. The fish was God's unique way to save Jonah. Let's not miss something equally as important. While God saved this runaway prophet from drowning in the sea, he also had a God-sized plan to save Nineveh from drowning in sin, and he wanted to use Jonah. If you and I had been in charge, we might have said, uh, this prophet is a loser, and he really needs to be disqualified. You better find someone else for the Nineveh evangelism project. To make application for us, God's miracles in our lives are for a lot greater purpose than for our own personal comfort, for our healing, for our survival. We are to embrace his agenda of serving him 
and to share his gospel with others. And you don't have to be an evangelist to do that. Now let's look at this short chapter of Jonah 2. It's a prayer, as you likely know. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. What a pathetic sight Jonah must have been at that point. Ugh. Makes you not want fish for lunch. Some scholars believe that Jonah actually probably looked like an albino from being in the belly of that fish for that long of time. Jonah had tried to run away from God. Now he ran back to God in prayer. This chapter describes him being thankful for the Lord's grace to him. We've likely all had some desperate times in our lives when we have said, Lord, help me please. Sometimes they are situations that are out of our control, and other times they are of our own making, as was in the case of Jonah. He had made a real mess of things. He just didn't seem to be able to learn the lesson quickly. We can understand that. The God that he was trying to escape from was now the same God who was his only hope. Jonah didn't say or pronounce everything he should have in that prayer, and we will get to that in just a little bit. But we do have three things that we can learn from this prayer. First, the prayer teaches us how to pray in the midst of our failure, when our circumstances are caused by disobedience. Often, that's when it's the very most difficult time to pray because we feel such self-condemnation. We think that we have no right to talk to God, or even if we did, he would not listen. However, Jonah teaches us that God always takes notice of humility for our self-imposed trouble. Remember the true story that I shared last week about Chuck Colson his salvation, and his transformed life. We can be certain that God knows when we are serious about seeking him. Jonah was in dire straits. He was crying out as a broken man, and he needed a mighty God. In our current day, we see so much pride and arrogance around us. We see people running away from God, people blaspheming his name every day. We see our world spiraling downward. We see it sinking lower and lower into the depths of sin, as Jonah did, into the depths of the sea. The truth will always be, as long as we're alive and breathing, that we have a choice. We do not have to forfeit God's love. Second, this prayer also teaches us to thank the Lord for confronting us with our disobedience. The storm on the sea convinced Jonah that he could not escape from God. His heart of rebellion was exposed. 
This had to happen for Jonah, and it has to happen for each Christian as he or she finds their way back to God. It simply won't occur with an inflated ego and a spirit of pride. Jonah expressed this gratitude that instead of perishing in the storm caused by his own efforts to escape God, that he was cast into the sea instead so that he could see the error of his ways and offer confession. Notice here in the prayer that there's no doubt in Jonah's mind who was behind the storm or who had allowed him to be thrown overboard. The Lord did it. Verse 3 says, You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. It was the Lord's action, and it was the Lord's sea. He exposes our sin, doesn't he? And when he does that, it is for our own good. It's crucial for us to understand that God loves us so much that he needs us to be able to see the error of our ways and the sin that we've committed, as Jonah did. There's actually a measure of relief when things are brought to a crisis point, when we can no longer run from them. Jonah was at a crisis point. In verse 6, he speaks of being on the floor of the sea or the roots of the mountain. There's no doubt Jonah thought that the sea was going to be his grave. As an example, we see here that God tracks us down and he stops us in our runaway path and he confronts us for what we are doing, like a parent sometimes has to confront a child. He needs us to go through a time of death where we surrender our self-will. As we pray, we're aware of the hopelessness of changing ourselves or the problem that we've created. We need a God to intervene. The moment of hopelessness that we sometimes feel is vital and needed so that we can give up on ourselves to figure it out and to take our hand and reach for God. There's simply nothing else that we can do. Sometimes we hit rock bottom in this life, and when we do, we surrender, and his mercy is there waiting to embrace us. We throw ourselves into the arms of the everlasting mercy of his. And that's when a resurrection of a new beginning can happen. When Jonah gave up hoping of surviving and knew that he was sinking lower and lower and lower, that is when God intervened and saved him. He said in verse 6, But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. Interestingly, the prophet received the mercy that he was unwilling to preach about to the people of Nineveh. Isn't it profound that God finds us no matter how low we are and that he will lift us from the darkness into life and to light? Then God's hand can resurrect us out of our self-made tomb. Sometimes we are so low we feel like we are in a self-made tomb. God would not heal Jonah's spiritual sickness until the prophet realized just how sick he really was. It's important for us to notice that Jonah was not able to be an effective prophet to Nineveh until he made things right with God. The same principle applies to us. If all we do today is just take out a spiritual magnifying glass and look at the life of Jonah, but we do not look at ourselves, then we have missed the help and the encouragement and the warning that God has for us through his written word. It's as if this book of Jonah is saying, sit up, take notice, be alert, watch out, be on your guard, and recognize the enemy for who he is, because a haughty and a prideful spirit can hunt you down and take you places that you do not want to go. May we be wise 
and heed the warnings of the Word of God. They're there to help us and to protect us and to instruct us to choose God's way that will lead through the narrow gate that he speaks about in his word. Otherwise, we will lead our own lives through the wide gate that will take us to destruction. Third, this prayer from Jonah teaches us that in our aloneness, the Lord is still willing to bring us his presence if we will allow him to. Once Jonah was thrown overboard by the sailors, he was truly alone. No cell phone, not to call for help to a family member, no availability to send a text to a friend and say, come and get me ASAP. Can you recall times in your life when you have felt totally alone? Have you known those places where no matter what time of the day it was, even if the sun was shining brightly outside, that there was darkness in your soul so thick that it felt like it was choking you? I imagine Jonah felt that way. Again, these kinds of places that we have in our life that occur on occasion do not always mean that there's sin in our life. But Jonah knew that he was at fault. He could not be rescued by anyone but by God himself. The Bible is clear that we should be actively involved in a church body. However, there is simply no person and there is no other thing in this life that can be a replacement for the mighty presence of our God. The world offers us all kinds of substitutes for the presence of God, such as busyness. It's an epidemic in our day, as you know. Busyness will lead us astray. We put God in the rearview mirror of life and we press the accelerator and we drive off the cliff to Satan's substitutes. Oh God, help us to remember what should be obvious, substitutes can never, ever be the real deal. Another substitute is money. The world teaches us that the one with the most toys and money in life wins. What a lie. We certainly have to have money to live. But by the help and the wisdom of Almighty God, we are to manage it, not for it to manage us. And then the substitute of personal power. Some people think mighty high of themselves. They want something and they will stop at nothing to get it, no matter how many people they have to hurt and step on in the process. Our world calls it getting ahead. That's not what God calls it. It's really a monster, nicely named personal power, and it will eat a person alive and leave absolutely no room for God. Nineveh had busyness. They were a booming city, like a New York of today. They had money, they had power, but they were ruthless and they were empty to the core. They had no time for God. I imagine in my mind billboards throughout Nineveh that read something like, want grand sin and corruption in your life? Get it here. Looking to waste your life? You're at the right place. We looked last week at Jonah's initial struggle to obey God and to go to Nineveh. He knew what kind of a city it was. It made no sense to Jonah for him to go there. But it was the right thing to do. You and I have to be careful to let God lead our steps and not to second guess his voice. We are to listen and obey, even if there's not a crowd around us that agrees with what God is doing. There's only one way to do anything, and that's God's way. If there's a secret to spiritual power, then it's obedience to our Lord. Remember when we used to play the game, follow the leader? 
If you didn't do what the leader was doing, you were out. The act of following means that you should imitate as closely as possible. So the question becomes, who are we following? The gripping good news is that if we have a surrendered life to Christ, we are in relationship with him, then we are wanting to learn to follow him more closely day by day. And he is a responding God to that attitude. As we review, we see that Jonah called to the Lord. The Lord answered him. Jonah said, I called for help. The Lord listened to my cry. Jonah said he sank down to the roots of the mountains, but the Lord brought him up from the pit. Jonah said what he had vowed to the Lord he would make good. The Lord then commanded the fish, and Jonah found himself on dry land. Not only do we serve a responding God, but we also serve a God that delivers. Jonah was now safe. But God still wanted to use him to preach to Nineveh. So Jonah wasn't off the hook just yet. Now we come to Jonah 3, 1 through 10, and Jonah 4, 1 through 11. These are very short chapters, and they preach all by themselves. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. Just like that, they believed God. A fast was pronounced, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals Herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, And how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. We understand that in Arizona, don't we? (laughs) He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. Do you see a theme here? 
But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Just a side note. Scholars, many of them, believe that what this means by the 120,000 is children. That they were so young, they didn't know their left hand from the right hand. Nina is believed to actually have at least 600,000 people that were there. As we reflect on chapter 3, it opens with Jonah's recall to mission. While God hadn't changed, he did have somewhat more of a cooperate prophet to use. That's noted in Jonah 3.3, saying that he obeyed and he did go to Nineveh. The first time, he didn't get it very well, so he chose to run and flee, as you know. This causes us to wonder about ourselves. Has life, and particularly the times when God has had to discipline us, have those times made us more obedient, more flexible to receive orders and to run with God and not away from him? In Jonah 3, 4, we see the number 40. We know that this is a significant number throughout the Bible. It's a time of testing. It's a time of purification. Jonah's basic sermon point was 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Scholars explain that this word in Hebrew, overthrown, can also mean transform, repent, to turn around. We know that the people of Nineveh listened and they did turn away from their wickedness, repent, and they were granted forgiveness by God. We must be careful to remember that it's not Jonah's skill at words that caused any of this to happen. It was the Lord working through Jonah. Communicators are only the instrument God uses. We know that the Lord does the real work through the Holy Spirit and the power of his word. The king led a citywide movement of repentance of the greatest to the least of Nineveh. Oh, how we would love to see that happen in America. Well, this is where we wish the story ended with happily ever after for everyone. However, Jonah spiritually relapsed again. And sadly, he did not desire the response that preaching on repentance produced. He was back to his idolatrous ways so quickly. Jonah's idol was Jonah. He was more committed to his prejudice, to his own ways, and his concepts of how God should act than he was to God himself. I want to just insert a small comparison here from last Sunday's message. In chapter 1 last week, we saw Jonah go below deck of the ship, as you remember. He laid down and fell into a deep sleep. In a horrific situation, a violent storm with sailors at risk, Jonah removed himself from dealing with any of it. Here in chapter 4, verse 5, he removes himself again from dealing with Nineveh. It's as if Jonah says, okay, Lord, I preached. Now I'm done. I'm out of here. He left. We're told that he went to an isolated east part of the city, sat in the shade, and waited to see what was going to happen to Nineveh. He wanted God to strike them dead. Now let's review and let's reflect on chapter 2 for just a moment. It's there that Jonah almost prays the right prayer, but he lacks true remorse and repentance. He objected to God's giving mercy to the Gentiles. Jonah said a lot of the right things, but not the most important. He didn't say, Lord, forgive me. I was in terrible error 
when I objected to going to Nineveh. You are sovereign, and I acknowledge your power to do whatever you desire to do and to give mercy to whomever you want to give it to. Jonah's problem was that he wanted to control God. When he could not do so, he got very angry again. Jonah 4, 1 through 3 that we read is that angry prayer. His destructive anger turned to self-destructive despair. Jonah literally prayed and asked to be let loose of life, that it would be better for him to be dead than alive. Again, he's trying to tell God what was best. Jonah wanted to win the final round of this power struggle with the Lord. Jonah would rather, would rather die than admit that he was wrong. Well, the book of Jonah ends like a movie. When we want to see more, we want to know more, it's a cliffhanger, so to speak. We hope and we pray that Jonah fully surrendered his idol of self to the Lord. It also leaves us with a question to ask ourselves individually. Perhaps that's the book's intent. Our own life portrait isn't fully finished yet. What it will be is dependent upon the mercy that we receive and that we give away to those who represent a present-day Nineveh. So often people see Jonah as the main point in this book. He is not. The Lord is the focal point. His enduring love, his patience and forgiveness poured out to Jonah, to those Gentile sailors, and to Nineveh. How eternally grateful we are that our God has poured out this same enduring love, patience, and forgiveness to us as well. How low, how low will God bow down to hear us and help us when we call. I have wonderful news for you today. No place is too far for our God, not even at the very depth of the sea or the roots of the mountains. Praise be to our God. Let's pray. Oh God, I thank you for this story of Jonah that is true. And I don't know how much it's helped this congregation, but it sure has helped me. We've heard it all through the years of our lives. But there's so much, Lord, that you have to teach us here in this book. And Lord, I don't know where our congregation is today. Some people probably walked through those doors with a heart so heavy. And Lord, it may not have anything to do with sin in their life. It's the circumstances, it's the brokenness of this world, the brokenness of relationships. God, I pray, I pray that you will help them to realize afresh and anew that you are always, always available that we cannot get to a place where you will not lift us up. I am so thankful to serve a God like that. God, I pray that you would help us as your people to live a life of obedience, even when we don't understand, when the problems seem so great and we're weary and we feel so weak Thank you that you are our strength. Will you strengthen us in these days, O oh God? Help us to persevere in the faith as never before. And I pray blessing and honor and anointing upon these people. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Our worship team, you may come at this time.
Aren't we blessed to have such great messages? Thank you, Pastor. All right, everybody stand for this last song and think of Nineveh, how Christ is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, the mercy following. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty. Forever author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. God's mercy be yours today. You're dismissed. Savior, he can move the 